Welcome to our Market Narrative series. I'm Julia Newbold, Managing Editor at Connexus Financial. Today we're talking about global growth investing with Raj Shant of Jenison Associates. Jenison Associates is a fundamental equities and fixed interest manager with proprietary research, 100% owned by PGM. Jenison has just released The Global Spectrum of Growth, a white paper which looks at the growth investment universe. Raj Shant is the Managing Director and Equity Portfolio Specialist based in London for Jenison. He supports Jenison across Europe, the Middle East and Africa. Raj joined Jenison in 2019 after 17 years with Newton Investment Management, where he was a Global Equity Portfolio Manager and Portfolio Specialist. Raj, thanks for joining me today in what promises to be a very interesting discussion on global growth investing. To set the scene, why are we talking about growth equities? Uh, thanks for having me, Julia. And uh, that's a great question to start with because uh, often that, that this most important issue is, is missed by investors in their conversations. So really, we think, uh, and Jenison has been a growth equity investment house since its founding in 1969. And in essence, it goes back to the basic purpose of investing. So fundamentally, all investing is about buying an asset today with a view of selling it in a few years' time at a higher price. That's your return, your investment return. And we think that the chances of being able to do that successfully improve enormously if between now when you buy the asset and when you want to sell the asset, say, in a few years' time, the company, the underlying company, has substantially been able to grow its revenues, its profits, and its cash flows. So somebody perfectly rational would come along and pay you a lot more for it than you paid because it's a much bigger, much more successful company, and especially if they can look forward to further growth down the line. So we think that growth investing, looking for growing companies, really enhances your your likelihood of being able to make a, a successful investment. Thank you. That's a great start. Raj, can you please talk about the current environment for global growth investing and some of the trends that you were seeing and what they mean for equities? Sure. Um, We're recording this towards the end of 2022, and it's been a terrible year for growth equity investing. Uh, Probably the worst uh, in absolute and relative terms for a couple of decades. Um, So, why has that been the case? I think essentially, if you go back over the last 12 months, every month uh, so far through the year, we've kind of had an upward uh, drift in inflation expectations for the world. And the corollary of that has been that interest rate expectations have continued to move up for most of the year until October, November of the year. And that has really been uh, bad for growth equity valuations. Now, that's an important point to note, that actually, certainly over the first three quarters of of 2022, what's happened is that the earnings for most growth growth equities have carried on coming through. But what we've seen is a sharp downward adjustment in prices. So the valuation of growth equities is really compressed. And that's been a direct function of rising interest rates. So the earnings of a growth company are further out on average than they would be for a value company. And so if your discount rate keeps moving up, so the present value of those future earnings goes down. That's one element of it. The other element is that we've come off a a few years of strong outperformance growth equities. And what happened during 2022 is that we've kind of lost the whole of the valuation premium gained during 2020, uh, during the pandemic. We've gained all the valuation. uh, We've lost, I should say, the entire valuation premium gained through 2019's outperformance and 2018. We're now back at relative valuations for growth equities that are below the long-term average. So it's been a very difficult year. Uh, But it does mean that we are now going into 2023 at a lower than long-term average valuation, an environment where 
the expectations for inflation and interest rates globally may have peaked. Obviously, that's up to the, each individual listener or reader to decide for themselves. And if that's the case, then as we go through 2023, we may well return to a pattern where those companies that are able to show the best, the fastest sales and profits growth will generate the best returns for investors. So you're feeling pretty hopeful right now, Raj? It's, a, it's certainly a promising setup for, for the next uh, next year. So can you explain to us what the role of fundamental bottom-up analysis is in the evaluation of global growth companies that you look at? Sure. So, you know, obviously passive investing has been a growing global trend. We think that investing successfully in growth equities is really an active uh, job and it requires proprietary fundamental bottom-up research. So let me start with the why, and then I might just uh, say a sentence or two on the how. Why is it, uh, does it require active investment? Well, our research, and this is in uh, the, this white paper, the global spectrum of growth that we put out, our research shows that actually when you're looking at the fastest growing companies in the market over five-year rolling time periods, the market expectations of what, which companies will be the fastest growing companies over the next five years is wrong 80% of the time. I mean, that's a stunning number, isn't it? For these allegedly efficient markets, in, even in companies that have a lot of analysts following them, on average, 80% of the time, the market is wrong about which companies will still be uh, amongst the fastest growing companies in the market. So you don't have to be exactly right. You just have to be more right than the market, uh, uh, more right 80% of the time. And that's where we think we have a great advantage. We have a team of fundamental bottom-up uh, analysts who only focus on growth equity analysis. There's seasoned professionals with over 16 years' experience uh, on average, over a decade of that having been spent at Jenison Associates. So lots of experience of looking at growth companies, lots of experience of working together. And really, the, the central task that they have is to build a bottom-up fundamental picture of the duration and the magnitude of the growth opportunity ahead of the company. And as I say, they don't have to be right to the second decimal point. They just have to be broadly correct and they're going to be beating the market 80% of the time. And where are you looking um, at companies? Do you have a very broad spectrum that you're looking at? Yes. We think that you know, to really grow substantially faster than the market, you've got to be doing something different. So what we're really looking for is companies that are innovating, companies that are disrupting, Fundamentally, companies that are able to offer their clients and their customers something different, something that other companies, other providers cannot offer. That's how you earn the right to generate superior, sustainable growth. And there is really no monopoly by region or indeed by sector as to where the great innovations will be. And what we've found you know, Jenison Associates has been doing growth equity investing since 1969. We found that the areas of leadership and where the real uh, great growth comes from tend to vary. They'll vary from decade to decade, even from one five-year period to the next. But there's no real uh, arbitrary set or geographic limits on where the next great innovations or disruptions might come from, the next great solutions uh, will come from. And that's what generates that superior, sustainable, long-term growth. Now, Raj, in your new white paper, Jenison uses the terms emerging growers versus stable growth compounders to describe growth companies. What do those terms mean exactly and why are they important for investors to know and understand? That's a, that's a really important question because so far in this conversation, we've really been talking about growth equities. And that 
it can sometimes give off the impression that there's one monolithic block of companies that are basically similar to one another and behave in the same way to, to one another. And that is incorrect. And so what this paper really talks about is the broad spectrum of growth. And we use the shorthand of the emerging growers and the stable growth compounders as a way of aggregating different types of companies that have different characteristics and indeed different risk and reward profiles uh, within the market behavior. So emerging growers tend to be the more dynamic companies, the newer, younger companies at an earlier stage of their growth cycle. They tend to have far more upside potential, but the corollary of that is that they tend to be more volatile, they'll often have more risk, and some of them won't make it. So, you know, the, the, they are the, the real breakthrough companies that can be transformational for a portfolio, transformational in terms of the returns and value that they create, but also can be higher risk. The stable growth compounders often will be somewhat larger companies they might have been emerging growers in years gone by, but as they've grown to a certain size, the growth rates have matured. They tend to be more visible, uh, reliable compounders, often with lower valuations and lower volatility, and a, therefore a lower risk profile. So the significance of using these terms uh, as a shorthand of, of showing different parts of that spectrum of growth is to show that how, over the long term, both categories outperform the broader market. But you get certain periods where the environment, the backdrop in terms of interest rates, inflation expectations is relatively stable, markets are relatively stable. Emerging growers will often do much better. You know, environments of steady interest rates or even falling interest rates, those emerging growers can really perform. But sometimes, like the period we've had in 2022, where interest rates are rising or the, the backdrop is it tends more risk averse, those companies will underperform the stable growth compounders and indeed, uh, at certain points in time, the broader market. The stable growth compounders, on the other hand, tend to be your steady eddies, if you like. They are the ones that year in, year out, are reporting reliable, visible, solid growth and will often outperform the emerging growers in periods of market uncertainty or in periods when the backdrop is changing, like interest rates rising or inflation expectations are rising. So, Raj, can you give any examples of what sort of companies would fall under each? Sure. So, um, if we start with the stable growth compounders, uh, some of the best examples of that would be some of the great global luxury brands, who generally, if you look at the long-term uh, profile of those companies, uh, they tend to have shown very steady, very predictable, very reliable growth. Other than periods when you get things like the SARS or the COVID pandemic, and people literally stop traveling for, for, for a certain period of time, these companies are actually reporting very reliable, strong growth. It's not as strong as the emerging growers, but it's still better than the market. And the, the benefit of that would be that you can see that what the growth is likely to be over the coming five years uh, relatively visibly. Now, you know, other areas beyond luxury goods might be some of the healthcare companies. Some of the faster growing healthcare companies tend to have very reliable, visible, strong growth year in, year out. The emerging growers tend to change composition more often, as you'd imagine, because they're the, the breakthrough companies that are really just emerging uh, for, from often the startup scene. They're breaking out, uh, really getting leadership from the broader market. So at the moment, it might be cloud-based uh, applications companies. These companies are writing code, uh, providing applications and functionalities for individuals or corporates or enterprises that nobody else has done before. And so these companies are growing incredibly rapidly. They're often making uh, decisions about investing more in their products, 
investing in research and development in marketing, uh, building out their functionalities. And so often their profitability will be much lower. So all those things I just mentioned would depress current short-term profits. And so some of those come, those emerging growers may not be showing any profits at all for one or two years because they're investing so heavily in their future growth. So those give you a sense of where the emerging growers and stable growth compounders may be sitting at the moment. And do you find that some of the analysts are more into the stable and more, and others are more into the emerging? Is there some sort of competition between the analysts of which way to go? Well, because the, uh, our team of growth equity analysts are really used to coming into the office each day and saying, right, where is the best growth in the world in my space? And they think about their space in the loosest sense. So, you know, for the financials analysts, they'd also be thinking about payments companies and fintech companies, et cetera. And I think their area of coverage actually leads them most directly to one category or another. More uh, uncommon is uh, certain sectors where you will get both uh, coexisting in the same space. So, for instance, you know, our luxury goods analyst, our consumer goods analyst is drawn towards luxury, and that's generally going to be stable growth compounding. Why? Because if uh, Ferrari suddenly quintupled their output, if Louis Vuitton uh, increased their output tenfold, you know, for a year or two, they'd probably sell everything they make. And then the brand would be a catastrophe. They'd destroy the brand value. They'd destroy their future earnings stream. So they can't turn into emerging growers because the very essence of what they do is uh, relies upon them carefully controlling output, carefully uh, ma- maintain that exclusivity and scarcity around the brand. Um, on the other side, uh, in terms of the emerging growers, certain areas are going to lend themselves more naturally to that. So the technology space actually, you know, you could say is one of the few areas that does have both. Some of the larger, more mature technology companies, you know, probably popularized by those acronyms like FANGs and MAGMA and all sorts of weird and wonderful acronyms that probably were outdated within the, the year of their formation. But those are generally very large companies now, extremely large companies and relative uh, saturation men in their key markets. They would tend to be more the stable growth compound end if they're not actually in outright decline. But the software as a service, the cloud applications companies also fall into the technology space. And so for our technology analysts, uh, you know, th- there is the option to go between the both. And so part of it is about the upside uh, and the risk and reward profile of each individual company. And then it's down to the portfolio managers to say, well, what's the environment in the market? Is this a great environment for the emerging growers with their greater volatility but greater upside? Or is it an environment for the more steady eddies, the stable growth compounders within that space? So the analyst, for the analysts, the choice is probably made for them by the space they cover. For the portfolio managers, they, they are free to range between uh, the different types of growth companies according to the, the environment that we, we're in. It's very interesting. Raj, what are some of the secular themes that are driving long-term growth at the moment? Well, we think there's always great growth opportunities at any point in time. And just to give you a sense of some of the, the, the biggest growth opportunities we see in the world at the moment, uh, one would be fintech. So, you know, you've got fintech in Australia, you've got fintech uh, in Europe and US, but actually the biggest opportunities we see are in fintech in the emerging markets. And to summarize the reason why, it really boils down to the competition. So the incumbent banks, whatever you may think about them uh, in Australia or or in Europe or, or elsewhere in the world, in the emerging markets, they often tend to be more bureaucratic, more uh, cumbersome, harder to deal with, have invested less in their websites, less in their apps, less in convenience. 
and often have a bigger profit pool. They charge their customers a lot more. So the opportunities for the fintech players in the emerging markets are just that much better because the competition in terms of the technology is worse and the profit pool they can disrupt is much bigger. So that could be a multi-year uh, growth opportunity for certain players in the emerging markets. I've mentioned already a couple of times in this conversation in lu- uh, the growth prospects in luxury. We think that continues to have a strong growth runway. From a couple of perspectives, whether you're talking about the new middle classes, the emerging markets middle classes in countries like India and China, still the desire to to, uh, have those luxury brand names uh, with hundreds of years of history, usually originating from Europe. Uh, It's very hard to get that kind of heritage, that kind of brand uh, cachet in other regions of the world. But even more interestingly is younger consumers. A lot of millennials, uh, Gen Z uh, uh, consumers, uh, rather surprisingly, are really keen on getting their entry-level luxury goods names, their, their, their big big brands. Um, and it's partly through the influencers on social media. It may be through the pop stars and sports stars. But actually, it's at, they are forming the newest customer base and a really strongly growing customer base for those luxury brands. And then finally, just one more uh, area of growth that we see around the world is electric vehicles. Huge growth over the last few years. But when you consider what a tiny proportion of the global fleet of vehicles is accounted for by electric vehicles today, and, you know, it doesn't take a stretch of the imagination given uh, the desire to reduce carbon emissions, given that Many electric vehicles are actually superior driving experiences in terms of acceleration, in terms of braking, in terms of safety profiles. It doesn't take a stretch of the imagination to think uh, we should be getting to half the global fleet of vehicles uh, being electric vehicles maybe within a decade. And more than that, if you think 10, 15 years from now, that's a huge amount of growth from here to there. But think about the entire ecosystem, the battery technology, the software that will go into those cars. Um, It's a little bit like, uh, you know, if you think of the internal combustion engine as the flip phone, your Ericsson, your your Nokia phones, and the electric vehicle as a smartphone. Uh, Actually, you know, some people literally call them smartphones on wheels. And there's a whole potential ecosystem of, Uh, streaming maps, streaming content, streaming entertainment that's only just begun to develop for those electric vehicles. So, uh, again, lots of different avenues of growth opportunities in the years ahead. That's very fascinating about the electric vehicles. And when you do look at what else they're going to need, that, you know, smartphone on wheels, fantastic. So, Raj, given market volatility at the moment, what does the future look like for growth companies over the short and long term? And what do you think investors should keep in mind right now? Um, Firstly, I know that any investor who really thinks they can predict the short term uh, is either fooling themselves or trying to fool other people. And so I I won't go there. But but thinking about the medium term, uh, which I would um, uh, regard as being, say, a year or so out, and the longer term is a multi-year horizon, we're we're ending 2022 in a situation where the environment for growth equities has been brutal. You know, and and I think that's pretty visible. Um, and, and so we are sitting at a valuation relative to the broader market, which is below the long-term average. We've eviscerated the premium that was gained during the pandemic in 2020 uh, and burned through 2019 and 2018's uh, premium as well. So the valuation setup is interesting. Earnings for these growth companies have been fine in 2022. Uh, and you know, for the, those companies that have got sustainable growth, by definition, looks pretty decent for 23 and 24. So you had a really interesting setup. 
And the key decision for, and then the key uh, pivot point, I guess, uh, for investors will be, what does the macro environment look like? Now, if uh, one goes through 2023 with inflation expectations and interest rate expectations rising every month next year, the way they did this year, maybe we don't make much headway for growth equities. But if your view on the environment is different to that, then actually the fundamental setup for growth equities looks really, really interesting. So I do come across investors around the world who say, well, what if it's 1970s style inflation or stagflation? Of course, you know, that might mean another year in the doghouse for growth equities. But if you believe that inflation will be, is coming down, will be coming down, interest rates may be stable at a high level or may even start to be cut around the world as we go through next year, then actually, you know, you, you've lit the fuse on, on the firework of growth equities. Um, fundamentals should be, should be the drive for returns, and that should really favour those um, stable growth compounders, yes, but the emerging growers could become really interesting again after a very poor year for performance in 2022. So I look forward to talking to you again in a few months to see what's happened. I I look forward to that as well. Thank you so much for joining me today, Raj. You've been listening to Raj Shad from Jenison Associates, part of the PGM Universe on our Market Narratives podcast. Thanks for listening. 